let's bring up our first guest of the night, Sharif Habib. Welcome, Sharif, to the stage. Hey, Jason, how are you? Fantastic. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I, I got to say, I was watching you, the energy and everything. I'm like, this guy's <laughs> command of the software is unbelievable. What does he do? And then I checked out your profile. And <laughs> here we are. I was like, man, I mean, this guy, how do you like how to work this thing? And here we are. Uh, well, 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 thank you so much. And, and, you know, I'm curious because anyone who's reading um, about your company are probably thinking the same thing. How did you get so good at pulling the strings and building an organization that we're going to get to traded publicly now? Um, but it didn't start like that. You know, I'm curious uh, to, to really find the beginning of your entrepreneurship journey. Like, do you remember the first time that uh, you had an entrepreneurship streak? Absolutely. Look, I mean, it's it's really not glamorous. The truth is I started my first business because I didn't want to ask my dad for pocket money anymore. It's as simple as that. There's nothing, there's nothing glamorous about it. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to have my independence and that's how it all got started. And how, how old were you when that happened? Um, just under 16, I think, I think like late, late 15, early 16. And uh, a buddy of mine just started a, you know, like I, I think many people probably on this chat, just an IT consulting business back in the day, you know, hooking up a, uh, a, a LAN or, a, you know, you know, getting internet into a dentist's office was a big deal. Yeah. Connecting a printer, we knew how to do that, um, and 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 we charged some money for it that we thought it was absolutely big bucks, and we thought we were living the dream, and we had a great time. And uh, I got to ask, <laughs> what did you use the pocket money for? Like, why did you want the pocket money at sixteen? Um, I wanted the pocket money just for my independence, just to go out, just to you know pay for a a rust box, just to do yeah. you know normal sixteen year old things. <laughs> Uh, now, were most 16-year-olds that you knew starting businesses? No, uh, but, uh, but they, were, they were doing jobs that I didn't really find interesting. Mm, interesting. So you, you sort of looked around and said, I want to do it a little bit differently. Um, whatever happened to that business? Um, nothing much. I mean, we, we ran it for a few years. It was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. My partner and I uh, made what we thought was, was great money. And when we met a third guy in university, we rolled that business into our second business and we brought that third partner uh, along and, and that's how we started the telecom business. And that was a whole other crazy adventure and we had another great time. And you were running those businesses while you were still studying? Yeah, I was a computer science major at Concordia here in Montreal. And essentially we stacked all of our classes in one day and worked on our business for six days uh, and, and it was as simple as that. Yeah. Classic maker schedule. I love it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> now did, were there lessons that you learned from, uh, doing school and business together that you sort of brought later on in your career that you sort of, you still think about today? Look, I mean, to be honest, we did the absolute minimum in school, just not yeah. to, uh, fail. Um, and, and we, you know, it, it was a necessary evil. I didn't, enjoy it. I didn't like it. I didn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, we just did the absolute bare minimum. Um, and, and, but we, we've devoted all of our waking hours to our business. And, and I, I think I learned more, uh, from running that business than I learned from school. Uh, that's just how I feel. Now at that time, did you think you'll never get a job? Like, do you think that you were unemployable and it would just be startups all the way through? I really thought so. And, uh, and that's why, you know, after doing this for a few years, I decided to try my luck at getting a, a real job. Um, and I only had, you know, kind of one real job in, in my life and, and, and that was it. But I wanted, I, I think I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder and I wanted to prove myself that I could get uh, a real job in a, in a respectable industry. And, um, and, and, and I did it and, and now I, I crossed that off my, my list and, and, and it's fine. Now I, I scratched it. <laughs> but come on, it's gotta be more than just the brand on the CV. Were there lessons that you learned, uh, whether pro career or anti career from those jobs that stick with you today? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, when I was in management consulting, uh, one of the things that I learned is I, I got the confidence of being able to learn about a lot of different industries. I got the confidence that I could speak 
credibly in a, in a, in a boardroom that I could speak to executives. You know, I, I didn't come from that background. I didn't have that upbringing. So I always, mm -hmm. you know, I always wondered whether I could have these conversations and being in management consulting gave me a lot of confidence. Um, and I just felt like even though I did the minimum in school, um, I was able to, you know, thrive and compete in, uh, in the real corporate world. And I did three years of that and, uh, and, and, and I was done. It gave me, uh, you know, great problem solving mm -hmm. skills, uh, you know, ex you know, hard work, um, just being able to, yeah, learn a new industry and figure out and figure out like, what are the main levers that was extremely useful to me. And then I got to, um, I got to travel a lot with the firm. Um, I actually did a, a hundred percent travel, which is unusual. Um, so I, I traveled in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, um, yeah. and we and just had a great time. I love that. Um, I also started my career at McKinsey and optimized for travel and did uh, <laughs> did a hundred percent. So I know you say it's rare, but uh, man, I wouldn't have it any other way. Okay, so you yeah. learn these great you learn these great lessons uh, about hard work, about communication, about your learning ability. And yet you started as an entrepreneur uh, at age, you know, 15, 16. Are, do you think entrepreneurs are born or are they, are they taught through these lessons? Is it, is it a nature or is it a nurture thing? I honestly don't know. I am not a, a, a psychologist, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I'd like to believe uh, that everybody can learn it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to believe that, you know, any, anything you want in life, you can, you can make it happen. And I'm a, I think I'm a great example of somebody who didn't have any, you know, special talents or hookups or, or network and, um, and, and it, and it worked out so far. So, um, I, I'd like to believe that any, anybody can do it. Okay. And now you're working on dialogue. So, uh, for folks that don't know about dialogue, can you give us the, the elevator pitch? Yes. I, by, by the way, I saw a comment by Mashal who says minimum in school, uh, you had, you, you know, you had a double master's, et cetera. And, 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 and just to, just to, just to respond to that, I did the absolute bare minimum at Concordia in computer science. And I had this chip on my shoulder and I, you know, I had this inferiority complex and I overcompensated mm. by, you know, going to McKinsey, going to Wharton. And I was like, okay, now I've, I know I can do it. And, and, you know, it, it came from a place of, um, you know, vulnerability, um, and just proving it to myself. So, so I hope that answers your, your, your question. Wow. You, you, you turned on the psychologist and you pretty quick there, huh? <laughs> I've come from a place of vulnerability. I love it. The tech TO community, keeping you honest. I love it. Um, okay. Thank you for addressing that. Now we got to hear, you got to tell us a little about dialogue. You talked about you not being a psychologist. What's available on dialogue. How does it all work? Um, you know, tell me a little bit about it. Yes. So we, um, you know, we started this business very simply because we wanted to use technology to improve how healthcare is delivered and consumed in this country. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, we zeroed in on the B2B, uh, business model, uh, because, you know, we have a universal healthcare system and, mm -hmm. um, unless you sell to the government, uh, it's difficult to, to make it work. Our innovation was to, um, uh, let employers pay for health and wellness services, which is something that didn't really happen be before 2016. So we started with a telemedicine app. You could speak to a multidisciplinary team of healthcare professionals, uh, in, 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 a, you know, on your phone. And then we added, uh, mental health and then we added EAP, which means employee assistant programs. And this integrated platform of all these services, um, has, has found, you know, good success over the last few years. Um, and we were able to position ourselves as a, as a leader in this nascent market. I love that. And, um, it seems you had a great, a great concept at the beginning. You started working towards it. I'm sure it wasn't always, uh, easy to get where you are. When, uh, you think about that succinct elevator pitch, what are some of the hardest parts that you've experienced that you didn't capture when you were deciding to go after this opportunity? Um, I mean, you know, the beginning of COVID, as you can imagine, was extremely difficult on us, like it was for so many people uh, in this country and, and around the world. Um, you know, we didn't know if we would have a business. We didn't know if we would have to, you know, let go of everybody and, and, and shut down. We, we didn't, you know, we, we kind of ran through all the scenarios. Um, of course, you know, we were very lucky in, 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 in a way that, you know, I think COVID has shown that telemedicine and virtual care is a necessity. Uh, yeah. It's not a nice to have. It's propelled us kind of in the mainstream 
Uh, so we were we were very lucky. But I would say that those first few weeks, um, as as the news were, were coming out of Asia, uh, were absolutely uh, you know extremely scary, and you know we didn't know if we we're going to survive or not. Was there there was there a moment in there where you weren't sure? Like like what would have what would have um, killed the business then? Would have been that. Um, you would have been run out of money at that point. Is it that like the demand would crater and that companies were no longer going to provide or subsidize yeah. healthcare for their workers? Like what, what was the, what was the internal fear? Yeah. So, um, uh, some of our clients are in the retail uh, space. They obviously all shut down. One of our big clients was Stif du Soleil. As, as you know, they had a really tough time. They've now reemerged and, you know, under new ownership and all of that, but they basically, shut down all their operations for over a year. We had a lot of clients that had a really tough time closing factories, closing stores, et cetera. And, you know, the doomsday scenario was these companies would go into, you know, full bore uh, cost saving mode and they will cut every benefit. And actually the contrary happened, right? Because all of a sudden employers needed to find a better way to support their employees, you know, physical and mental health. And all of a sudden, they were, you know, looking for uh, for companies like us to come in and, and deploy quickly. So conversations, you know, went from, oh, can you deploy in three months to can you deploy on Monday? And and, and, and that caught and you by were, surprise. Absolutely. Look, I mean, it was it was a it was a positive surprise. Yeah, <laughs> it was a positive surprise. Uh, but we, we were it, it could have gone it, it could have gone either way, to be honest. So tell me about today, uh, the scale of dialogue. Like, um, what are some of the uh, the numbers that you like to brag about? <laughs> yeah, so um, you know, we we have um, a million and a half uh, Canadians uh, that are direct members of the company, and when you include um, their dependents, so that means their family members. You know, depending on how you count it. You, you know, you, we always we almost have ten percent of the Canadian population who's on our platform, you know, directly or indirectly, which is which is extremely humbling and impressive, and and every day, you know, I can't believe it. So that's kind of the main number that I think we're we're very proud of. And these folks use the platform quite a bit. Um, if you look at the number of consults we have every day, uh, we are probably you know either the biggest or you know one of the top three. Uh, biggest, highest volume healthcare providers in the country, you know, bigger than the biggest hospital in, in the GTA or, or whatever it is. So um, that that is just amazing. I mean, I, you know, we wow. never thought we would get there when we started. Now, when that demand started to pick up, right, you didn't know it was going to go, if it was going to, if demand was going to disappear at the beginning of the crisis or, yeah. uh, or double down and it ended up growing, I guess you had to really kick your uh, operations into high gear. <laughs> What did that look yeah. like? Was it a struggle to keep up with demand? <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, it, we we had to almost 10x our care team uh, within six weeks. Um, we had a team of 27 full-time recruiters um, in order to hire all these folks. Um, and we just, I mean, we, I, I think the team really rose to the occasion. It was a once in a lifetime uh, situation. Everybody worked extremely hard. And, and, and we made it happen. And I'm extremely proud of that. Now, when you were, uh, building the, uh, printer hookup business at 16, did you, did you dream about bringing that, that company public? Uh, not that company, but I've always had the dream of, uh, of doing an IPO one day. I, I honestly didn't think it would come, uh, uh so early. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought this would be like a, you know, mid forties, late forties. Uh, adventure. And um, so I'm really happy that we did it when we did it, but it was always kind of in the back of my mind. It was, it was one thing I wanted to do. So even when you started dialogue, was that the goal uh, was to eventually one day bring it public? Yes. So our seed investors, our series A investors always asked us like, what's your exit? Who's going to buy you? And I said, nobody's going to buy us. We're going we're to go public. And people would kind of chuckle uh, like, okay, that, that that's nice. But like, really, I was like, no, really, we, we want to go public. Um, again, I had the timeline wrong. I, I thought it would take us uh, 10 um, and, and not five years, but mm -hmm. sometimes okay, things so happen. And... Yeah, this is a good one. And so uh, you always had in the back of your mind, was there a moment 
where you realized it was going to happen in five years and not 10 years? Like when did, when did it click for you that it was, it was about to happen, that you had to kick off the process for real? I think in April or May of 2020, one of our investors um, sent me an email saying something like, um, you know, there, there's, there's all these rumors of companies in the U.S. going public. We, you know, there, there might be a window, an IPO window. And now, now it's obvious, like a year later, it's obvious. But, but back in April of 2020, I was like, this guy is out of his mind. Like, we're just like trying to survive. And, um, but he, he really was, was, you know, thinking ahead of his time and, and it, it kind of stayed in the back of my mind. And it was really over the, um, between Christmas and New Year, uh, my CFO and I had several conversation, conversations uh, between Christmas and New Year during the holidays. Mm -hmm. And we were like, do we do it? Do we not do it? And then we decided to go for it. And uh, early January, uh, we convened a, a board meeting and we said, you know, we're doing this. Everybody was super supportive. And, and uh, we, from, from kickoff to the day we were trading, um, it was 78 days. And I am told by the guys at the TSX and, and our lawyers, et cetera, that it's a record um, in Canada for, for an IPO of that size. There were, you know, smaller IPOs that got done uh, uh, faster, but for a company of that size on the TSX, uh, that was a record. And it was just a testament of like, when we decided to do it, we went all out and, and we didn't spare anything. Your poor CFO. He is a machine. He's amazing. <laughs> now, has your it was, it was his first IPO, but first, okay, yeah. No, so so I was going to ask you a question. So none of us on the team had done it. Uh, the CFO uh, had never done a, an IPO. I, I hadn't either, but we decided uh, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it right. And we assembled an amazing team internally, um, as well as you know the, the best lawyers, accountants, bankers, etc. So we were surrounded by amazing people and, and we did it and, and we're super happy with the result. And do you remember the day of the IPO? Of course. Yeah. How can Where I were you? Tell us the details. Where were you? What did you do? So, so, you know, sadly, if it wasn't COVID, we would be in Toronto, we'd be ringing the bell, we would be doing this whole thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, with, with, with COVID, um, you know, it's, it's a little less exciting. So we went public on a, I think it was a Tuesday, Mm -hmm. uh, but on the Friday before, we recorded with our team on Zoom the ringing the bell ceremony. Mm -hmm. So you know it's completely anticlimactic. You're sitting at home, and and you're clapping, and then they replay that video, you know, on on the Tuesday. So right. it's not as fun as, as as being there or being at the at the NYSC. But you know, it's still once in a lifetime, lifetime experience, and we had a blast. Yeah, and and um, on Tuesday when it actually opened and you saw your video play, you saw yeah. Friday Sharif uh, applauding. What was the feeling like? How did you feel? I, I wore the same shirt just to you know <laughs> get the illusion going. Look, man, it, it was amazing. I mean, I, as I said, I'm you know I don't come from that world. It's not my background. Uh, so to me, it was really a once in a lifetime opportunity. I was extremely humbled, emotional. I was like, I could I couldn't believe it was happening. It was just amazing. And what's next for Dialogue? Now you've, you've achieved this dream that you thought was 10 years out. You've pulled the future forward by five. Uh, what's, what are you excited about for the next chapter? Well, now we've got to deliver, right? I mean, we, we, we went public for a reason and, and, and we told a story uh, to our employees and to the market and our shareholders. And now we have to deliver on that. Um, you know, when you, f first of all, just to, just to rewind, all of my previous businesses were bootstrapped. So mm -hmm. Dialogue was the first venture back business, which is a new experience on its own. But right. then when you go public, you know, like, you know, my mom is a shareholder now. My dad is a shareholder now. My, my wife is a shareholder. It's, it's a whole, you know, you're, you're a shareholder. Absolutely. I, bought, I bought an IPO day. I logged on to Well Simple Amazing. Trade. And I bought, those, I bought those shares. I got to support Power Family, you know, and I got to make it. sure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, look, so that's the difference, right? The difference is that. Well, actually, I have some resolutions I was hoping to read right now, if that's okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> the prospectus, page 14 of the prospectus. I was wondering what that said. Exactly. No, that's right. And so you feel this fiduciary uh, duty to, you know, people who before it was just you, right? You, it's funny because you started this as a way to find independence, yeah. as a way to be free of asking dad for pocket money. 
Yeah. And here you are. Now dad is a shareholder. Exactly. And you got to go back to him. Exactly. Again, to approve your plans. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> so I guess it didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay. We're going to enter into a two minute lightning round. All right. Some of these questions make sense. Some of them just to get to know you a little bit better. Are you ready? The important right. thing is you don't think too much about the answers. You just got to go. Okay. All right. Two minutes on the clock. Sharif, what's your favorite food? Steak. Did you have a steak on IPO day? I did not actually. <laughs> is there a favorite quote or motivational um, you know, icon that keeps you going? Um, you know, uh, Roosevelt's speech about the man in the arena, uh, when I was uh, in consulting, I realized I was not the man in the arena and that's when I decided to leave and, and be the man in the arena. And I hope I will always be the man in the arena for better or for worse. Oh, I love that one. Uh, restrictions on travel are lifting. Where's the next place you're going to go when you leave Montreal? Uh, we are planning a family vacation to Lake Louise this summer. Fantastic. If you're in Alberta, drop some recommendations in the chat. Uh, who has helped you the most along your entrepreneurial journey? Um, I would say my parents. How? Um, you know, people always say, you know, I've made it on my own. I'm a self-made success. But, you know, with parents like mine that were supportive, that always, you know, gave me a home to go back to. I could take a lot of risks and I, and my down, my downside was always protected. So I'm very grateful to them. 30 seconds left. One last question. Describe a company that you wish existed, but doesn't yet today. Oof. Huh. A company that existed, but does not yet today. Um, I would say dialogue. I mean, dialogue is the company that I'm serious. I mean, you know, we're, we're not there yet. But mm -hmm. the, the dream of having healthcare that works as well and, you know, 21st century uh, healthcare that we're trying to build that doesn't exist and, and we're trying to be the first ones to do it. I love it. Unbelievable. Sharif, this was awesome. Uh, I heard that you might be adding to the team. I know you already 10 x in six weeks in 2020. Yeah. What are your plans for 2021? Yeah, we're we're hiring a lot in every single department. Uh, thank you, Leah, for putting our our our, our careers page there. Um, if you want to join an amazing team who is literally changing the world and making people's lives better, please join us. Please come talk to me. Uh, we're looking for the best talent in Canada. Unbelievable! That was great. Thank you so much, Sharif. Thank you. Thanks for having me.